The Prussian army in its heyday was considered one of the strongest armies in the world and served as an example to follow for many states. After the German Empire was emerged, it became the basis of a powerful German army. And today, we will consider the first stage of this path, when the Prussian army went from a small military formation of the Prince Elector of Brandenburg to the elite military machine of Frederick the Great. Russia as a state entity appeared in the early 16th century. After the state of Teutonic Order suffered a final defeat from its neighbors, Poland and Lithuania, its territories were withdrawn from the subordination of the church and partially divided among the winners. The region of Prussia itself was split into two parts. The western part became a Polish province, and the eastern part was turned into the Duchy of Prussia, which was in a vassal dependence on Poland. And at the beginning of the 17th century, East Prussia, due to a dynastic marriage, joined the electorate of Brandenburg, which was ruled by the Hohenzollern dynasty. Therefore, although Prussia was originally a territory in the Baltic region, over time, this name spread to all possessions of the Hohenzollerns with its capital in Berlin. The accession of Prussia to Brandenburg coincided with the beginning of the Thirty Years' War, when the lands of the Hohenzollerns suffered greatly. For example, Berlin lost half of its population. During this war, the shortcomings of the formation of the elector's army were exposed. The army was recruited mainly from mercenaries, and after the end of hostilities it was disbanded. Permanent units were only enough to protect cities and fortresses. As the fighting stopped and resumed over the years during the Thirty Years' War, the electors were in constant search of mercenaries. In addition to the fact that such an army had low morale, it also behaved aggressively towards the local population, which was subjected to constant robbery. The mercenaries were not tied to the area they were defending, so cities and villages suffered from the attackers and the defenders. There was a need for radical changes in the recruitment of troops for the Hohenzollerns and many other European rulers. Focusing on the Dutch military reform of the late 16th century, the great elector of Brandenburg Frederick William, in 1644, decided to create a standing army. It took a long time to organize it. For the nearly 50 years reign of Frederick William, Brandenburg's army continued to depend on mercenaries. During hostilities, the size of the army could reach up to 30,000 people, but in peacetime it decreased to 7 or 8,000. However, the first step has been made. Recruitment sets were organized so that the army consisted of the local natives. According to the Dutch and Swedish models, schools were founded for officers recruited from the nobility. In armament, Brandenburg also took the leading European armies as an example. Pikes were taken out of service and massive matchlock muskets were replaced by lighter, faster-firing flintlock guns. After the Thirty Years' War, Brandenburg finally got a respite from the constant wars on its territory, so Frederick William had the opportunity to test the combat effectiveness of his army away from his own borders. East Prussia, by that time, continued to be a vassal territory of Poland. To eliminate this dependence, the Elector's army took part in the northern war between Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and Sweden on the latter's side. In 1656, in the Battle of Warsaw, 8,500 Brandenburg soldiers and 10,000 Swedes defeated the 40,000-strong army of the Commonwealth in alliance with the Crimean Khanate. After that, Poland abandoned its claims to Prussia. Brandenburg troops also participated in Austro-Turkish War of 1663 and the Dutch War of the 70s. By the way, while the elector's army was in Holland, his former allies, the Swedes, wished to take advantage of this and invaded the territory of Brandenburg. But the army of Frederick William made a quick march back to their homeland and defeated the Swedes in the Battle of Ferbelin. The battle was won mainly by the forces of cuirassiers and dragoons because the infantry fell far behind due to the sudden movement. In the Swedish army there were more foot soldiers, who eventually faltered under the cavalry attacks. That was a small battle. The forces of each army did not exceed seven or eight thousand people, but it had great psychological significance. This was Brandenburg's first independent victory over the army of one of the leading European powers. 
The success at Fermelin is considered the beginning of the rise of Prussian military power. Frederick William, by the way, was nicknamed the Great Elector for this victory. After him, Frederick I came to power in 1688. He is remembered primarily for the fact that he made Prussia a kingdom while crowning himself. But since part of the Hohenzollern possessions, Brandenburg actually, was within the Holy Roman Empire, he needed to achieve recognition of himself as king from the emperor. A compromise was found. In the territories of Prussia outside the empire, he was a full-fledged king, and in Brandenburg, he became known as the king in Prussia, formally remaining a vassal of the emperor. The first Prussian king has gone down in history as an extraordinary waster. He spent almost half of the entire state budget on the maintenance of his court. Because of such a financial policy, the army did not develop much, but nevertheless, some improvements took place. Under Frederick, the final transition to recruiting was completed, and the military ceased to depend on mercenaries. These recruitments were, for the most part, forced. During the reign of Frederick, the troops of Brandenburg and Prussia fought almost continuously on various fronts. First, it was the War of the League of Augsburg against France. Then the War of the Spanish Succession, which lasted 13 years. The Prussian army suffered heavy losses, but the troops gained a lot of experience and established themselves as persistent and skillful. Also, under Frederick, the first steps were taken towards the general standardization of the army. Innovations were associated primarily with Leopold I, Prince of Anhalt-Dessau. Under his leadership, a more rigorous training system appeared in the Prussian army. Particular attention was paid to the action of foot formations. Through constant exercises, Leopold ensured that his troops became more organized in battle and managed to fire more shots in average than the enemy. To increase the rate of fire, an iron ramrod was used, replacing the wooden one. The drill included tougher discipline, in particular corporal punishment. A military tribunal was also established. Bringing the troops to the universal standard was reflected in the appearance of the soldiers. They were dressed in blue uniforms, so as not to cut the maintenance of the royal court, because the blue fabric was the cheapest. In 1713, when Frederick I died, the Prussian army numbered 40,000 people and continued to increase. Frederick William I, who inherited the crown, was the opposite of his father, nicknamed the Soldier King. He immediately introduced a regime of the strictest economy and began with himself. He sharply reduced the number of courtiers and cut the court's expenses by four times. He drove out all the artists and architects and did not build a single palace, which was not typical for a king. Just in Potsdam there are now 17 palaces, built by different rulers. Frederick William I even saved on food. For example, it was not customary to dine in his palace. But, of course, the matter was not limited to personal savings alone. Frederick William streamlined the tax system, encouraged the development of manufactories, and, if he saw prospects, he always made the state a shareholder. By the way, in Potsdam, a manufactory supplied uniforms for the Russian army. The king was personally acquainted with Peter the Great. They were allies and, one might say, friends. The redistribution of expenses and cuts in the huge palace budget allowed Prussia not to disband part of the army after the end of hostilities, as many European countries still did, but to maintain it continuously. From childhood, the king loved the army. He wore only a military uniform himself. Frederick William visited the barracks, delved into the life of a soldier and took care of their resettlement. For example, Potsdam was built up with half-timbered houses, made in the cheapest way. Then they were sold for a low price, but with the condition that one of the rooms would be occupied by soldiers, usually four or five people. In an attempt to improve and increase the army, Frederick William used every opportunity. So he exchanged 150 expensive porcelain vases, which he inherited, for 600 Saxon soldiers. They were then called so, porcelain dragoons. The king also liked tall soldiers. His recruiters did not spare money for the giants and collected them throughout Europe for the grenadier battalions, 
Under Frederick William, the formation of the Prussian army became more centralized. Prior to this, when recruiting new soldiers, each regiment acted independently. The main problem was the unwillingness of the people to join the army. To avoid the excessive severity of the Prussian army, conscripts often joined the troops of other states. To prevent these problems, the country was divided into regions, each of which was assigned a regiment. All male children were registered for military service and the units were recruited from them. The service life of a conscript in peacetime was usually 2-3 months a year. For the rest of the time, the soldiers could return to their farms. Citizens usually were exempted from military service, but had to provide housing for soldiers. It was a prototype of universal conscription, which the Prussian army would switch to in the 19th century. Nevertheless, there were still not enough Prussian soldiers for the growing needs of the military. The regiments continued recruiting foreigners, sometimes on such a scale that some neighboring rulers even banned the Prussian recruiters from their countries. The army under Frederick William doubled and by 1740 amounted to 80,000 soldiers. For comparison, the Russian army at that time numbered about 120,000 and the French, the largest in Europe, at 160. Although Frederick William I went down in history as soldier king, the Prussian army fought only once under his reign. During the Great Northern War against Sweden and its allies, Prussia took the side of Russian Empire and contributed to the capture of Swedish possessions in Pomerania. After the war was over, most of these territories remained under Prussian rule. Despite the little combat experience gained by the Prussian army under the soldier king, the rough activity of Frederick William made it one of the best in Europe. Prussia got plenty of opportunities to demonstrate its power under his successor, Frederick the Great. Immediately after taking the throne, the new king occupied Silesia, starting a war with Austria. Prussia managed to retain these lands. The Austrians were defeated in the First and then in the Second Silesian War. At the same time, the king paid great attention to correcting mistakes. So, during the First War, the Prussian cavalry lagged behind the Austrian, primarily in mobility. To work out cavalry actions, as well as to maintain the overall combat effectiveness of the army in peacetime, Frederick instituted annual maneuvers. Before the Second Silesian War, which began only two years after the first, 20 new squadrons of hussars were added to the Prussian cavalry. As a result, the cavalry made up about a quarter of the Prussian army and became its strong side. In addition to Frederick, the successes of the Prussian cavalry are also associated with the names of generals von Titten and von Zeidlitz. More than once, they decided the outcome of battles with the brave cavalry strikes. Those generals were examples of personal bravery and demanded the same from their officers. The power of artillery also increased. Before the Second Silesian War, the Prussian army had about 220 guns, but 20 years later, in 1763, there were already more than 700 of them. Despite two convincing Prussian victories, the war for Silesia flared for the third time, but now whole coalitions of the leading European powers were involved. Plus, the fighting was carried out in their colonies on different continents, so the Third Silesian, or the Seven Years' War, became a world war practically. The Prussian army at the time of its beginning already numbered 150,000 people, but it turned out to be completely exhausted fighting against Austria, Russia and France. It was only thanks to the so-called miracle of the House of Brandenburg that Prussia managed to end this war with no major losses of its lands. The unexpected death of Empress Elizabeth led to Frederick's alliance with the new Emperor Peter III, who was an admirer of the Prussian king's talent. Although they had to fight on several fronts at once, Frederick and his generals won several brilliant victories during the Seven Years' War. The king was an adherent of the so-called Oblique Order, when the main forces secretly grouped to attack only the left or the right flank of the enemy. To hide the direction of the main attack, smaller troops also carried out an offensive in the center and on the opposite side. The Prussian army created numerical superiority in one spot and, if the enemy was overturned, the center of his army became exposed to a further attack. 
Such tactics required precise maneuvers and strict discipline, so it was just right for the Prussian army. With the help of an oblique order, Frederick won an unexpected victory at the Battle of Leuten over more than twice the superior forces of Austria. But it also happened that these tactics failed, for example in the Battle of Kunersdorf, where Frederick was defeated. Although during the Seven Years' War the Prussian army seemed to mobilize all its resources, nevertheless, after its end, the number of troops increased again, mainly due to foreigners. At the end of Frederick's reign in 1786, the Prussian army had 140,000 infantrymen, 40,000 cavalrymen and 10,000 artillerymen. Every 30th inhabitant of the country was a soldier. In Europe they said that each state has its own army, but only the Prussian army has its own state. In general, we can say that the Prussian army owed its rise to the personal qualities of rulers and commanders. At the end of the 18th century, the military remained strongly dependent on the figure of the king. For example, the successor of Frederick the Great, Frederick William II, showed little interest in the army, which immediately affected its fighting qualities. But such dependence has already become a relic of the past. The French, whose army was the most advanced then, gradually switched to the new army structures. Divisions and corps were formed, which included all branches of the military. They were supplied independently of each other and could solve combat missions autonomously. The Prussian army was much less flexible. The disadvantages were especially exposed during the Napoleonic Wars. A period of stagnation has begun. The commanders and officers who went through the Silesian Wars gradually retired and there was no worthy replacement. But the willingness to learn from its mistakes could not be taken away from the Prussian army. It would come renewed out of the Napoleonic Wars and a new stage in its history would begin.